Everyone is joining from the waiting room. What a lovely way to spend a um, Thursday afternoon on a Zoom session talking about the future of finance. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, my name's Morgan Popley. I am the, what am I? I'm the program lead at Macquarie University's incubator. Um, and what we have today is a Venture Cafe session. And it's a session which is run um, in partnership between Venture Cafe, which is a global, um, how do you call it, an entrepreneurial connection um, event series and Macquarie University Incubator. So we're working together to bring this, um, this session to you today, which is, a, is one in a series of monthly sessions. So um, we have them all recorded. You can watch the ones in the past or you can put the next ones in the calendar. Before we kick off, I just wanted to give you all, when I figure out what I'm doing with my share screen, ah, that's where we are. Before we start, what we like to always do here at the Macquarie University Incubator is pay our respects and acknowledge the traditional owners of the Macquarie University lands, which is the Wadamadigal clan of the Darug Nation. So we pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And um, if you happen to know, because we have everyone zooming in from lots of different locations today, if you happen to know the traditional owners of your land where you are right now, feel free to put that into the chat. It's always really nice to see where everybody's, um, everyone's zooming in from. Melissa Ryan is our Director of Entrepreneurship at um, Macquarie University. She's there, what land are you on today? Cool. Thanks for sharing. So what you'll see in front of you um, is this is the this is the building. So an, an incubator is really a building. We always laugh about we're called the incubator, but it is it's the name of the building. Um, this is where we work when we're not locked down and working from home. So normally we'd be at Macquarie University um, in North Ryde um, working in this incubator, and we work with um, uh, well I'll rephrase that. We like to think of ourselves as the beating heart of entrepreneurship uh, in the university. And what that really means is that we build and support an innovation ecosystem um, within Macquarie University and externally. So we do that by working with um, external startups who come in and, and work here from this building. Um, and we've got a couple, on the, couple of our panelists here today uh, are in that category. Um, we work with university researchers who are looking to innovate, maybe commercialise the research that they're doing. Um, and we work with uh, corporates and externals as well, as well as the students. So we build innovation programs and design thinking types of things with our students from undergrad, postgrad and um, higher research students, so people doing their PhDs. That's just to give you a bit of context about who we are and why we're here and why we might be interested in this. We're very fortunate to have this really amazing panel um, here in the discussion today for the future of finance. So to give you a little bit of background, I've worked in financial services education space for a number of years. So this is something that's really interesting to me, but it's since I left, this has just progressed and gone way past where my knowledge is. So I'm really looking forward to learning and asking some great questions of the guys here. Um, this is also not a closed um, panel by any means. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask, feel free to pop it in the chat. Um, or if the time's right, feel free to put your hand up and take yourself off mute and um, join the conversation. So to kick us off, again, I've said that three times now, but to kick us, to kick, kick, kick us off, um, I'd like to hand over to our panel, to each of you, to just briefly introduce yourself and tell us one thing about why you're passionate about this subject matter. So I might start with, to my right is Sam. Good evening, everyone. Hi, Morgan. Hi, everyone. Welcome on board. Uh, so my name is Sam. I'm the founder of Benevolence Financial Group, one of the social enterprise financial uh, startups at the incubator. So our vision or our mission is to be able to use the power of finance to create a more just and sustainable world. And it gets me really excited talking about finance or even property because it's usually the biggest purchase that we'd ever make in our lifetime. 
Um, and being able to use that transaction or that purchase towards creating a more just and sustainable world is, 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 a, is inspiring. It's, it's uh, exciting for me. Um, so that's a bit of introduction. And I might hand it over to Jack. I think Jack's right next to me as well. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. So I'm Jack Parkin. I'm a digital economist at Western Sydney University. I have a PhD in cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology, believe it or not. And I'm head of product for Ligon, which is, it originated as a consortium between the big four banks in Australia and IBM and Centre Group, who own Westfield. And we're digitizing the bank guarantee process to, um, to get rid of the paper process, basically, which is a pain for all our users. And I'm excited about the future of finance um, because I've been in the crypto space for a little while and I'm uh, I find the innovation very exciting, but I'm also, uh, I've gone through a journey where I've been a big proponent and a bit of a skeptic, and now I see myself as a realist, but then we all do. Um, and so I quite like to bring up the, the, the biases and limitations that come with technology so we can build a, you know, a better future. Oh, well, am I passing on? Sorry, I'm going to pass on to Bernie. Right, no, we, we, this is a great convention. Okay. Yeah. What's the virtual baton? Who's it going to? Thanks, uh, Morgan. Thanks, Jack. Uh, Bernie, uh, co-founder of Proxima Capital. Uh, so we're at the incubator, uh, team of eight full-timers, uh, eight uh, part-timers and contractors uh, around the planet. Uh, so we're uh, in a similar space to Jack, but I suppose um, we've set up a fund, a cryptocurrency uh, market making and arbitrage fund. Um, we've raised about 20 million US in invested funds and other about 10 million uh, us in debt that we've of uh, since about march so we we managed that for our investors around around the world um doing a pretty good job at it um what i love about the space i mean there's just so much innovation ha happening in the space it really does my brain in and i turn up to work each day and i learn something new which is awesome um i think it's a great way uh you know for our team and our investors to uh, to make to make money in a different way compared to traditional finance, but I love the opportunity. Um, I love just thinking about you know financial inclusion and what this means long term, um, uh, you know, for our for our planet. And uh, I guess we go into that a bit later. Over to Martina. Thanks so much um, and welcome everyone to our session today. So I'm Martina Lindlücker. I'm a professor uh, in the area of, of environmental finance and, and based at Macquarie University. So I'm heading up the Center for Corporate Sustainability and Environmental Finance. And we are essentially at the intersection of environmental change and you know, the financial impacts and implications. So we are looking into, you know, on the one hand, how finance can actually help us solve a lot of the environmental and social problems as well that we are facing, but we're also looking into the financial impacts of global environmental change. So for instance, what does climate change mean um, in terms of financial impacts on companies and on industries? And um, we also do have a very much uh, a big overlap into the digital space as well, uh, with a lot of colleagues around me working on, on digital finance solutions. So essentially, I think what brings me to this area is really the importance of the topic, right? the importance of, of finding solutions to the pressing problems that we are facing. And it's both, I think, personally and professionally, a really important topic for me. Um, and with all of our research and the projects that we are running through the center, essentially the whole idea is you know, to bring new models, new solutions, new insights into what can be done to tackle these problems, but also to provide guidance um, to policymakers. For instance, I'm a contributing author to the International Governmental uh, Panel of Climate Change Reports. So I think it's also really important for us to sort of you know, have that policy impact as well. And I think that's, that's uh, an exciting part of our work as well to see those policy changes. So yeah, looking forward to, to the discussion today and I might hand it back to Morgan to actually get us started with the questions. Oh, that's brilliant. Thanks, Martina, and thanks to everyone. And I might actually just stay with you, Martina, because it's so relevant. Um, I've been thinking a lot about, um, so, like, what are some of the big trends? Like, getting the order to kind of just talk about what are the big trends that each of you have been thinking about recently or looking at? Um, and the thing that came to mind for me was thinking about, uh, I might have mentioned this to each of you before, is the, you know, the, the idea of instant gratification in society and how we need to have everything right now. Um, and so some of those things I've got a colleague who loves 
on the call loves uh, Afterpay and things like that. Um, and uh, and you're seeing all these new kinds of products that are sort of emerging. What are the kinds of things? So that's interesting to me. What are the kinds of things that you guys are sort of you know pondering about at the moment? Martina, you might like to kick us off with that one. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, what's keeping us busy at night is certainly, and during the day as well, it's certainly, you know, as I mentioned, this whole um, question around, you know, what are the types of solutions that we need at this given point in time to really bring about lasting change? One area that we have started to look at is um, in particular situated at this intersection of um, sustainable and digital finance. So we are seeing a lot of development there. I think in terms of financing sustainable development, it's really you know, become a very important topic become a big question how do we mobilize the right kind of funding you know to actually really bring about lasting uh, change in terms of transitioning to a cleaner technology uh, future right in terms of addressing the social challenges that we are facing and we see a lot of concerns there at the moment is you know who is meant to be financing this how can it be financed and there are certainly political avenues that are facilitating that in terms of funds flow from developed to developing nations but I think importantly we also also see a huge um, you know, private sector engagement around these topics as well. So for us, I think it's exciting to see that these digital solutions are emerging, you know, that they make finance more accessible as well on a micro level to the everyday sort of person, right, in particular also to customers who traditionally didn't have access to finance where we see the big challenges at the moment is you know just because we do have access to technical solutions or new technologies it doesn't automatically mean that these translate into sustainable outcomes right so we might have new avenues for micro credits micro lending you know all these types of, of, of avenues but just because people can access them doesn't automatically mean that we have a lot of sustainable development going on right so for us one of of the big questions big areas at the moment is certainly you know how do we manage this greater access to finance financial inclusion and certainly also what can we do to actually combine this sort of access with the idea of bringing about sustainable development and certainly we also want to ensure that this is done in a way that we are not just simply you know adopting models that might lead to unintended consequences such as you know the exploitation of potentially really vulnerable people that are sitting at the other end of this Wow. Um, and Jack, you've got a bit of a different um, background, things you, you might have been thinking about. What are you? What yeah, weirdly, I do have a master's in sustainable development, but I haven't uh, fused the two worlds uh, so much recently. Um, but what I've been paying attention to, as always, is the, is the price of cryptocurrency. Um, have done for the last, I don't know, eight, nine years, maybe, since 2013. So just, just about seven or eight. Um, but it's been a bit, well, actually, I, I tell a lie. I actually wait for people to send me a message now because it's better for my mental health rather than checking every day myself. Um, but I've been looking more at the manipulation of the cryptocurrency price at the moment um, with recent events such as Elon Musk on SNL, Saturday Night Live, and his interest in Dogecoin and Bitcoin and the power of one tweet being able to cause cryptocurrency to spike or crash, um, which... I mean, events sort of always move markets. Um, we've, for example, uh, with the BP oil spill, sh shares in BP fell by 50%. Um, but with crypto, this is being a very public network. The orders of magnitude are a lot bigger in terms of spikes. And um, it means that, and this has happened in venture capital for quite a while, in that you have a very renowned technology expert. They... Uh, endorse a certain product and then it's called signaling where lots of other small venture capitalists will go and invest in that that thing um, but with cryptocurrency obviously uh, because it's so public a tweet can make um, all the difference in a price and when we're looking at places like El Salvador suddenly um, accept, allowing their citizens to use bitcoin as legal tender um, whether that is a source of freedom um, whether that, that's great, you're detaching monetary policy away from a country and allowing them to use something else, or whether that suddenly exposes people to 
a volatile currency and one that they probably don't really know how to use uh, in a fragile economy. So those kind of things have been in my mind at the moment. Very interesting. Bernard, what are you pondering? Yeah, similar stuff uh, uh, to, to Jack, I guess. Um, I mean, I'm pondering uh, blockchain smart contracts, um, probably going to that one of the later questions, but I just think uh, there's some amazing potential there from what I've seen. Um, you know, I'm, I'm excited about, uh, you know, the blockchain's promise for financial inclusion, but like Jack and, uh, you know, Martina probably, you know, there's elements of skepticism as well, but I also just think this is, this is the nature of capitalism, right? At, in the early phases of exponential technologies, there's always speculation, right? That's the first network effect. Um, and it's kind of, uh, it results in these massive swings um, in assets, uh, the assets themselves, we're talking about the token assets, but also the, you know, the businesses around them. The manipulation question that Jack raises, I think is interesting. I, uh, to me, I think that's evidence of the immaturity of the space. Uh, I do think that's something that will uh, settle over the next 10 years. Um, time, will, time will tell, but I do think that's an inher inherent weakness that Elon can, can tweet something and we'll see a 50% a move in an underlying crypto. That's kind of, uh, that's kind of crazy and not, not really sustainable. And it, it's really, you know, upsets the, the promise. In terms of, you know, fin financial inclusion, uh, you know, uh, Martina would know this better than me, but, you know, 30% of the world being unbanked, that's 2.7 billion people. You've got a billion people living under pure, pure authoritarian regimes. Uh, and you've got 20 countries with, you know, inflation rates of, of more than 10%. Um, and so we jump back to uh, what Jack introduced about, say, El Salvador. And this is the experiment they start on the 7th of September with, um, you know, the declaration of uh, Bitcoin as legal tender there. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to, to watch and see how that unfolds. Um, you know, apparently they've got three banks in El Salvador. Um, they can't even talk to each other. Um, so they're really quite crippled. Um, 30% of El Salvador's GDP is through remittances. Um, and typically, you know, the likes of Western Union or Union Pay will take 10% on average of those remittances and keep it for themselves. So there's enormous cost there, you know, especially for these families that are working offshore trying to send money home. And, you know, this is what I think the the government of El Salvador is attempting to look at. Say, well, can we actually fix this um, with Bitcoin? Now, this, the particular solution is... Um, is, is using the Lightning net Network, which is a layer two solution on top of Bitcoin. And that's, so they're using it as a payment rail um, and less so as a Bitcoin asset. Um, so people are able to move US dollars around or tokenized US dollars uh, using uh, you know, the Lightning Network. Um, be interesting to see how it goes. I don't think there's gonna be that much early reliance on Bitcoin as an asset, but we will see. Uh, but yeah, very interesting experiment. Thanks, man. It's really scary stuff as well, guys. Um, Sam, what about you? What are you thinking? Yeah, more so from a lending perspective domestically here, particularly with housing affordability at the moment. We all know the current property prices. Um, you know, it's becoming more and more difficult for millennials specifically. Um, there was an article that came out, I believe, yesterday, some research done by Home Loan Experts, uh, one of the biggest mortgage brokerages, brokerages here in Australia. And they, they were mentioning that, you know, through their research, um, one in five Aussies, particularly young Aussies, are now relying on cryptocurrency rather than, you know, savings account or buying a property as a way to accumulate wealth. And that's something that we're seeing happen quite consistently with our clients with rent vesting. So, you know, being locked out of the market, the deposit requirements being, you know, difficult to, to attain, uh, you know, income levels not increasing in, in consistently in line with property prices as well. Um, a lot of moms and dads, you know, the bank of mom and dad helping out a lot of uh, first time buyers. Um, in saying that, the government's also jumping in with a lot of new schemes. So there's a new scheme for single parents uh, with a 2% deposit, they're able to purchase a property, which is terrific. But then you look at the borrowing capacity and if it's just one income owner, how are they going to be able to, you know, <laughs> service a debt level of an average of 1.2 million because the property prices are over that. So it's, it's a, it, there are a lot of challenges and I think the solution isn't just one direction or one, you know, just the government getting involved. There's going to have to be uh, multiple uh, interventions. We're looking at the lowest interest rates. They're speaking about axing responsible lending laws, which means that the banks may not have the liability or the responsibility that they do now when assessing applications, which raises a lot of concerns. 
Um, at the same time, there are calls for regulation for investors to give other people a chance. So uh, just a lot happening um, in this space that affects all of us, really. Anyone that has the dream of owning a home, um, and especially if you're graduating with a lot of hex debt, you've never worked full time and you're about to start working on a 60K grad salary for the next few years. By the time you save up, the property prices would have increased a bit more. So uh, some real challenges there. I think the other two key things that are pretty exciting as well is the digital transformation that's happening um, as a result of COVID in this space and also the sustainability uh, focus. So uh, there are new now fintechs in this space that can approve home loan applications within four hours, within, you know, from start to finish, which is just incredible to be able to do that in such a short period of time, uh, using leveraging a lot of technology and open banking, et cetera. And this third point with, around the sustainability piece as well is uh, you'll notice a lot of banks are now offering green home loan products. Um, if you meet some certain sustainability requirements in your property, uh, they then incentivize it by providing discounted interest rates, which is really exciting that they're encouraging and incentivizing this kind of behavior. And that seems to be where the future is heading. But it also seems to be what millennials care about. And so they're catering for that as well. Uh, so these are just a few things, the housing affordability, the digital transformation, the sustainability that's happening in this space. Excellent. So it's not all bleak. <laughs> um, let's move on, guys. Um, so this is really an open question. So get the, so feel so let's pretend we have buzzers and it's a game show and you can buzz first and start the conversation. Are there any financial trends that are being accelerated or decelerated as a result of COVID? You guys are seeing? I'm happy to jump in there. Go, Mar go Martina. Um, okay, fine. I go first. <laughs> I wasn't sure what our buzzer is that we have to press to actually. You, you just won 100 points, so you're in the lead. Thank you. That's exciting. Um, look, I think, you know, we've obviously seen great upheaval in, in international markets as a result, right? Um, you know, we had, a, we had a very sudden crash to begin with, and then obviously, you know, a miraculous recovery. Um, I think the real unprecedented outcomes were certainly, you know, prompted by the huge amount of government spending that's gone into the COVID recovery. Um, and I think we are still yet to see the long-term implications of this also because, of, as we all know, we're in, in Sydney lockdown, right? A lot of the spending is still going on from a government perspective. So that has certainly uh, contributed to quite a fair few disruptions, right? As mentioned, you know, the house, housing market, uh, certainly the stock market um, that has also reached new heights. I think, you know, for us, the big future challenge that I can see on the horizon is how do we actually move out of these developments, you know, into, into something that resembles more of an equilibrium? Because I don't think there will be this infinite kind of growth possible, right? It's just not... Uh, actually substantiated also not by underlying values here. Um, so we will actually face, I think, a situation, right, where we will see, you know, a, a reversal of these trends. There are certainly concerns around, you know, inflation, uh, potential market crashes on the horizon. The other sort of related um, point that I see with that is, you know, there's also been this huge um, um, trend towards, you know, putting funding into um, green recovery. That hasn't happened so much in Australia, but certainly in overseas markets. And I think it will be really interesting to see how that plays out in the overseas uh, jurisdictions and what that actually means for Australia's position, given that we are still so fossil fuel dependent, right? So at the moment, you know, Europe has made a huge push for the green recovery, so have other nations. Um, and I think just monitoring that at the moment, you know, that does raise questions regarding Australia's um, position overall in terms of, you know, the future technological development. I might just hand over to Bernard, who was buzzing at the same time. <laughs> Only 50 points, Bernard, for you. Oh, damn it. Oh, well, Morgan, that's it. <laughs> no, not friends anymore. Um, yeah, so my perspective, uh, yeah, so basically similar to Martina there, we've seen uh, enormous asset price inflation, uh, but I, th I think the reason for that is because of uh, currency debasement. We're seeing central banks globally basically purchasing their own debt, uh, effectively issuing, uh, issuing new cash uh, into the system, you know, of the order of, I believe, 20%. Uh, per annum, uh, and it, which has to result then in asset prices jumping, and that's what we've seen. 
Um, and the, interestingly, that's separate to inflation, which is, you know, a measurement of, uh, you know, the cost of living, which we haven't seen uh, that much evidence of, except for the last few months, we've seen a bit of a jump in that. Um, and asset price inflation, yeah, we've seen it in houses, stocks. Uh, as, as one example, uh, uh, 10 years ago, uh, my son encouraged me to buy a pinball machine, Indiana Jones Temple of Doom pinball machine, which is a fantastic toy uh, from, the, from the 90s, uh, paid five grand for it. Uh, since COVID, uh, a combination of uh, asset price inflation and people being stuck at home, I can sell it for 50 grand uh, now, which is, uh, which is kind of crazy. Um, so then what else are we seeing? We're seeing, um, uh, you know, crypto assets uh, being used. And I think um, Sam mentioned this, you know, people are, are, are using crypto assets as a store of value because they say, well, well bugger it, I can't hold cash. It's being debased. Um, uh, I can move into uh, or property, but again, obviously there's much higher prices than that. Stocks and people go, well, you know, a bit worried about those valuations, etc. So we have seen, you know, the likes of Bitcoin going up 4x in the last 12 months, Ethereum 10x. Uh, and the crazy thing I don't understand is gold, gold, which is, the, you know, the, the good old, uh, the, uh, you know, fear, fear asset or a debasement hedge asset has gone sideways in the last 12 months. And that's something I can't explain. And, and perhaps it's because people are using other tools other than gold uh, as a way of um, attempting to protect uh, their asset values. Uh, back to you, Morgan. Yeah, wow. So we've got a question in the um, in the in the chat. Are you going to sell the pinball machine? Uh, <laughs> well, I did discuss this with my son, and uh, you know he's decided now it's an heirloom, and so there is no price apparently on it, according to him, anyway. <laughs> very good. And uh, Ian asked, I think you've answered in the chat, Patina, but is the micro lending credit industry regulated? Mm. Yeah, so as I said in the chat, right, uh, the sort of traditional micro lending that's been, um, you know, um, um, facilitated through the traditional outlets, so such as, you know, the banks handling this, I think this has been largely regulated, obviously, we've got some jurisdictional differences there. But what we see is, you know, a lot of um, lenders just sort of popping up at the moment, you know, also facilitated, obviously, through new digital channels, right? We've got apps, we've got all sorts of, you know, um, more or less uh, dubious websites out there. And all of that is really unregulated. And you can certainly also imagine the sort of institutional environment where this is situated, right? Um, you know, when you think about some countries in, in Africa and other, you know, very developing regions of the world, there is not necessarily a legislator sitting there and actually providing oversight, um, which is certainly, you know, prompting uh, uh, some concerns in that, in that regard. Brilliant. And I just wanted to, Joseph said BNPL Afterpay, et cetera, which I, um, Jack, I think you, you, that was one of the things that you were kind of talking about, right? Not me. Nope. No, I just made that up. That was me. I was <laughs> over it. Me. Um, so. Oh, the so I mean, I've, I mentioned, um, I have been done research about six months ago on payments and digital payments and the increase that those have happened. So I suppose that is an afterpay bent as well. Um, but purely because of COVID, we, um, you know, a huge, uh, huge uh, increase in, say, uh, pay wave, uh, people buying things online, uh, people using afterpay. And um, firstly, because we're locked up, so we're, we're buying online more. Um, also, in shops, people are seeing coins and notes as dirty, so and possibly micro-ridden. And so using pay wave as a, um, and digital payments as a way of getting away from uh, the physical touch of paying. Um, and that is wrapped up in the whole privacy debate about how much people uh, know about your transactions. Um, I certainly get peeved off when I get, um, you know, ad served ads of, about something that I've bought that day. So that obviously the, the store is selling my data on to third parties and, uh, other third parties are buying that and then serving me ads about things that I'm, I'm interested in. Um, so, and that rolls back to the cryptocurrency debate as well. So it could be a way given its privacy, uh, enhanced privacy mechanisms of escaping the surveillance capitalism that we're in now where 
um, there's a, a churn of data going on behind the scenes and we're getting uh, targeted advertisements to to our preferences, which I don't mind too much, but it, it does annoy me at times when I'm, you know, I bought, I bought some glasses the other day and um, I was served blue, lens, uh, blue light lens glasses straight away, which I'd never spoken about to anyone or it was an impulse purchase and there I was being served it again on Instagram. Amazing. And that's a really great segue for our next question around digital digital literacy and what role what, what role it plays and whether the move to digital is working for everyone or if we have groups that are being left behind. Right, I think we need to buzz again. Can I buzz again oh, no, for another no. 100 points? <laughs> oh, you are flying. Latina? Right, yeah. Um, so, well, my thoughts on that topic are essentially, you know, we've obviously got, you know, great potential with, um, you know, the new digital solutions. And I think there's definitely great um, opportunity um, to actually, you know, get much, much larger access um, also to, to very non traditional uh, um, consumers and, and regions of the world. What we see at the moment is, you know, that even though we are rapidly developing um, digital solutions uh, from a sustainability point of view, they're not always inclusive and accessible, right? And we can probably see that even in the Australian context at the moment, where not everyone in Australian society is enjoying the same level of internet access, of access to electronic devices, and certainly also not the same level of education, right? We just have to think about some of our very remote um, and indigenous communities, for instance, right? Um, those of you who've been uh, to those regions may have noticed the uh, drastic lack of internet access there. You know, we, we ran a program in Vipa um, um, a few years ago when we were still all able to, to travel freely. And, you know, outside essentially of um, the, the um, compounds there from the big mining industry, you had absolutely no access to internet, right? It was very fragmented. And from what I understand, that situation has really not changed ever since, right? So I think when we think about um, you know, digital solutions and essentially digital literacy. I think one step even, you know, before that is definitely providing that initial access to people. And then there's certainly, you know, another element of actually having people who can, you know, interact with that sort of technology, right? We certainly see some, some uh, good programs being developed as well. You know, there are attempts uh, you know to 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 encourage that financial literacy but I don't think this is even in Australian society something that we widely have have you know solved so it will be even harder to do that on a global level I think um, I'm happy to jump in next Morgan if you like yeah you can have another 50 uh, thanks mate so yeah, I want to just touch on uh, blockchain smart contracts here. Um, uh, to me, that's uh, you know pretty exciting uh, space, uh, enormous innovation happening. So the the you know for those that don't know, blockchain smart contracts are basically uh, yeah, pieces of code that are publicly uh, anyone can drop a piece of code onto a supporting blockchain and anyone can execute it, providing they pay the gas fee. Uh, gas fees, uh, you know, relatively high. And so those early smart contracts tend to have tended to be uh, financially high value in nature, typically swapping contracts and borrowing and lending platforms. As an example, about two months ago, um, I, in, I, I had a crack at one of these uh, with a bit, bit of help from uh, Oli, my co-founder, and uh, we hopped on Aave smart contract on Polygon, uh, deposited a bunch of uh, Ethereum into the smart contract and withdrew $1.5 million worth of US dollars out of the, out of the smart contract. Which we stuck in um, in our which I stuck in the fund uh, that we that we run and we did this all in well under one hour without any paperwork. So Matt, from an innovation standpoint, that is quite an interesting uh, data point. Um, now, there's, that obviously brings around a whole plethora of questions. You know, what about the regulation? What about uh, you know terrorism? What about crime, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, and the, the, I think. We can't have a too long a discussion around this, but firstly, you know the fact that um, blockchain really enables sort of permissionless access uh, is fantastic 
in many respects from a financial inclusion perspective. If we're talking about, about people in authoritarian regimes, um, uh, you know, or people who've got access to a mobile phone have that having that potential. The problem is the moment the gas fees are so high that you can't hop in and do a microfinance loan using a smart contract yet. Um, so that's a bit of a problem. And the other thing is the UX is not straightforward. You know, this uh, it was it was actually you know quite a few steps to jump through, but you know, excitingly, I think within a few years the UX will be uh, it'll be you know much much simpler. Um, and I think then you know, this is a, a threat to traditional banking as well. So I'm really interested to see how this uh, this space develops over time. Nice one. Well, we might take this opportunity to throw um, to the to everyone else on the call any questions that anyone has. If you want to take yourself off mute and ask it, this is a really good opportunity to do that. Um, and uh, just open up the conversation a little bit. We've got Paul Hogan is is on the call and he's he's charging for autographs. So anyone like is a Paul Hogan fan? Uh, I'd suggest Paul Hogan uh, Morgan shows himself. Uh, he's uh, the yeah, he's a part started. of the Macquarie team. <laughs> oh, Before you pump up any cash to through a smart contract, there he is. Paul. I, haven't, I haven't prettied myself up today either. So. <laughs> I, I think it's better for all of us if I do this. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So if you, you want to engage with uh, 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 Macquarie University, um, he's the head of corporate engagement, so reach out. Yeah. Please be. Um, don't pay him any money for an autograph, though. Uh, Scott. Scott, do you, you've got a really good question. Do you want to jump off? Do you want to take yourself off mute and ask it or do you want me to? Yeah, there you are. Yeah, sure, no problem. So a great, great conversation, really interesting stuff and uh, certainly around the, the blockchain piece and cryptos and where they're going and where what, what is the value of money these days. But obviously a lot of us are sitting uh, working on startups, working on different businesses uh, and trying to find financing for those businesses and just wondering how you might see... Uh, the, with the future of finance and with people saying, well, I'm not going to borrow money from the bank anymore. I can't, I can't buy a house. I'm looking for somewhere to put my money to get a return. Uh, the smart contracts that you mentioned, how, how do you see like uh, in a year's time, two years time, potential change in the way you might look to finance your business versus the traditional VCs, angels, et cetera, that you, we use today? Um, I respond somewhat on that and then the rest of the gang can help me out on this um you know what we're seeing and i was going to mention this a bit later on is uh crowd lending and crowd funding um are seeing more and more of that um we're partnering um uh, just as an anecdote with uh, a company called lend for good uh which is in the impact space uh but it's basically crowd uh, crowdfunding of of loans uh, for impact ventures. So for instance, a classic example, uh, there's a company called Living Joy Capital based in Newcastle that upcycles housing up there. Um, so these are these are not micro loans. Uh, well, they can be depending on which country they're from, but say uh, 50K to upcycle a, a house up in Newcastle, take one of those old old houses on, on stumps and move it to a relevant location and upcycle it and, and reuse it for, um, uh, for multi-party uh, accommodation. So, uh, you know, the, the, that 50K, uh, once the DD is done on it, um, can then be broken up into parcels and people can come in and, and basically uh, take parcels of that. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we're seeing the likes of those loans then actually being settled on blockchain. Uh, and then ultimately what gets quite exciting is then, you know, those loans can then be... Uh, uh, a secondary market can be provided for those. As soon as you have a secondary market, then it makes the primary market much more efficient. Um, so, uh, and I, I, so the concept there of the um, uh, of the crowdfunding, crowd lending, whether it's lending or, or or into equity, I think is something we're going to see a lot more of. Uh, but I'll leave it to uh, my colleagues for other perspectives there. Yeah, funnily enough. Um... In 2015, when I was in Silicon Valley doing my PhD research, um, I was doing snowball sampling for trying to find my participants, research participants, which led me to some weird and wonderful places, um, one of which was Boost VC, which is a third generation venture capitalist called Adam Draper, 
whose granddad wrote the startup game and I think was the first one of the first um, venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. Um, and they bought, so when Ross Ulbricht of Silk Road um, was arrested, the, the FBI seized all of his Bitcoins and they were auctioned publicly and they bought, the, the Drapers bought these, these cryptocurrencies and then started investing in cryptocurrency companies uh, with this Bitcoin. Um, so that kind of uh, cryptocurrency investment has already happened, but it's very much edge case. Um, whereas, as Bernie was alluding to, now we're seeing a crowdfunding element to that cryptocurrency where I can um, you know, deposit a certain amount of cryptocurrency in a fund or smart contract and other people can borrow that cryptocurrency. Um, so it's becoming, I suppose, a bit more decentralized in that essence rather than a big venture capitalist firm. And um, yeah, there's a lot of possibilities in the future for uh, crowdfunding through crypto and obviously more traditional crowdfunding. Thanks guys. Um, we've got a couple of questions about whether it's too late to invest in cryptocurrencies. Does the this is thing I'm sure a lot of people are thinking, is the horse kind of bolted on this? Um, is that for me, Morgan? I think it might <laughs> be right down the line. I'm, 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 I'm like, staring into your soul here, Ben. What a, yeah, you've got look, to start by saying you're not a financial advisor. Oh, uh, yeah, and past, <laughs> perform past performance is not indicative of future returns. <laughs> uh, well, look, uh, I mean, cryptocurrencies, there's like 8,000 of them, right? Uh, a vast majority of them are scams and rubbish uh, and whatnot. Um, you've got such a broad range. You've, you've got purely, you know, digital assets. Uh, you've got tokenized assets. Uh, you know, this, uh, you know, you've got tokenized gold. Uh, you've got tokenized currencies. Uh, you, now you now have synthetic equities uh, that, that exist um, and uh, you've got, you got smart contracts uh, or you've got, the, you, you've got the tokens of the smart contracts themselves, the reward tokens. So there's an endless list there. Uh, so it's a very broad question, really. I mean, it's just like, is it too late to invest in the stock market, uh, you know, 100 years ago? Um, no, I, I think the, the short answer is no, it's not. But uh, caveat emptor, you know, in terms of you have to be cautious about where you, where you stick your money. But, you know, I'm very, op I'm personally very optimistic uh, with, uh, you know, holding, holding blue chip cryptos, Bitcoin, Ethereum, you know, in, in particular. But um, that's my perspective. Jack, what's your take? So I will start by saying I'm not a financial advisor. Um, given I've been following this since 2013, right, and I've seen lots of bubbles. Um, I personally think we're at the foot of another big bubble, which will go up and then crash again. I don't think we've we've come out of that cycle yet. Um, so, but yeah, like like you said, Bernie, there's a lot of trash out there. So, um, no would be my answer. But I think if you were to get in, you'd also have to be ready to get out because there's as much as there's a lot of returns in this game. There's also you know a big chance of losing a lot of money. So always invest what you can afford to lose and um, try and diversify if you can to minimize your risk exposure. But I don't want to push anyone into, into weird avenues. Although it sounds like people already are. That was interesting what Sam said earlier about um, people investing more in cryptocurrency than houses. I imagine that's because there's a lower bar barrier to entry in terms of you can put $100 in crypto if you like, and you, it's very hard to do that in property. Um, but yeah, those are my two cents or two Satoshis. Brilliant. And that's a really good segue for our next question, which is around, um, uh, I'd like to direct this one to Martina and Sam, if I can, around you know, what are some of the ethical considerations that people um, need to make when they are investing in some of these more products? Yeah, we're actually doing, you know, quite a fair bit of research on the um, ethical side of 
you know, be that uh, digital solutions or also um, just currently working on a project as well that looks into the ethical considerations around, you know, if you wanted to invest into, into cryptocurrencies. Um, I mean, there's certainly, you know, multiple different layers involved in this, right? We've got more sort of like global problems around this in regards to, you know, it does create avenues and challenges, you know, when we think about terrorism or other dark channels that are using these types of solutions, right? So that is certainly, you know, the sort of like larger scale of this creating all sorts of issues. I think on a smaller scale, it's probably more related to, um, you know, if we've got people investing in it, do they really understand the risks that are associated with it? And I think sometimes, you know, that is that is a little bit debatable as well. And certainly when we also tie that to financial literacy, well, I'm not entirely sure that, you know, the, the everyday person is always quite so you know, aware of, of all the ramifications that, that come to it. I think, you know, the advice essentially, you know, only invest what, what you can lose, right? Also, you know, with the caveat, I'm not a financial advisor either, only a professor in finance. Um, you know, so I think that's actually like a really good consideration, right? We've certainly seen, you know, people making a lot of quick and easy money with this, but we have also seen the other side where people have essentially, especially, you know, once we see the bubble crashing, where people have essentially also lost um, um, a lot of their investment, right? And I think, I think sometimes what we see, especially if we follow these debates, you know, in internet forums, we see a lot of this FOMO movement going on, right, where everyone just wants to jump on this bandwagon and get rich quickly. And yep, if I just throw money at this new coin that come out, you know, I'm, I'm, we'll make millions. And that's certainly working for a small percentage of people, right, especially when you get in early. But if you sort of join that in the late stages and then our risk of a crash, that is quite a, quite a different situation. Um, so I think that's certainly also a consideration also from an ethical point of view, I think important um, to consider that, especially when we make these technologies available very, very widely, you know, and we have wider parts of the population investing in it without actually having fundamental understanding of risk return sort of ideas in finance, right? That's really cool. Yeah. I have a question just off the top of that, which was around um, the, so that, so that, how do I phrase this? The risk that, so investing in a riskier product, you've got like a younger demographic coming through going, oh, we have less, so let's all like invest in all these, we, you know, put all that money, all these, I've, like I've talked to people that have put so much money in particular product, like investment products, newer ones that, and then they've like basically done Done them, so I, I want to swear with them. They've got nothing left, right? And is it driven? Is is there like a social factor of we've got it? We've got these rising house prices, like you were saying before, Sam. People can't get into the market. There's like a there's the need to catch up. How can I catch up really quickly? I can buy lottery tickets. I can play keno at the club. I can you know put all my money on black sort of thing. Or I can invest in these things. Is that is that a, a factor in the uptake of some of these products? Uh, uh, probably um, Martina might be better to respond to this specific question, but I think from what we see when clients come to us, savings interest rates at the moment are record low. So even if you're putting that money in a savings account, the, the alternative or the, the other options that are available are pretty limited around what you can do with the money to, to invest that. And so I think there's a difference I see to an extent from your risk appetite of how much you're willing to risk versus the ethical considerations that you need to make when making those uh, purchases to an extent. Um, and, and so for more from a banking point of view, a lot of times, even who we bank with, for everyone here in this today dialed in, who we bank with also matters, who we have our superannuation also matters. Um, and we tend to see that a lot of um, millennials come to us specifically when they're looking for finance, their preference is around uh, ethical banks in quotation marks. And what is ethical? What is the definition of ethical? And so we tend to do, you know, look at the difference of do no harm versus do good banks that don't necessarily you know actively support their communities but they're not funding fossil fuel versus banks that you know don't fund fossil fuel they're supporting their communities they're doing as much as they can in where in the communities that they live in and in towards the planet and so from an ethical point of view something that i'd like to draw everyone's attention to is um and that's some part of the education that we provide a lot of our clients is the impact of 
the 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 bank that we bank with in a way um, towards the environment, towards their employees, towards the planet. Uh, sorry, I already said the the planet towards the communities as well. That's the three lenses that we look at when we're determining whether a bank is ethical. Um, and I think might be a similar stance on an investment. And I might get Martin or one of the other panelists to jump in. Is from an investment point of view, how can we look at it from an ethical lens as well, not just the risk uh, appetite point of view, but how can we make decisions that also affect others around us and the planet as well, um, to be more considerate in those decisions and take that in our decision making um, kind of process. Yeah, I might quickly add to um, Sam's point around this. I mean, you know, one of the big sort of unresolved issues around uh, this entire area of, you know, combining uh, green and digital finance is certainly, you know, the carbon footprint underlying, um, you know, when we, for instance, look at Bitcoin, right, uh, how much energy is actually used, you know, in, in, in this entire process. And yeah, we've got various different estimates of how much that really is, um, but it is pretty substantial, right? So it would actually equate potentially the carbon footprint of a smaller country, right? And I think that is, um, you know, if, if you're looking in sort of, you know, green investments or ethical investments, um, that I think always comes with a big sort of question mark, right? And that I think is something that um, might have to be considered in the future as well. There's certainly, you know, alternatives. I've also got some colleagues in the area currently looking at, you know, actually lowering that carbon footprint or looking into, you know, uh, zero carbon solutions around this. Um, but I think, you know, if, if you want to talk about real like green investment sort of options, that's definitely something that we have to factor in from that regard. That's brilliant. We've probably got time for one more question from the audience. If there's anyone in there with some, you're dying to ask this question. You want to see if Martina will win 100 points and answer it first, or if Bernard will finally get there. Okay, well, what we might- stand by, pressing my buzzer. <laughs> hovering. Oh. I, well, I have a question. And this is a definitely a buzzer one because this is a really good one for us to wrap up on. We've talked a lot about, you know, it's pretty heavy, some of this subject matter. You kind of think, oh, but what is, like, in terms of um, the future and what's one thing that each of you um, is seeing that's really positive um, about the future of finance? So on your buzzers. All right. Do I get $100? Hey, I said points, not dollars. Oh, come on. <laughs> 100 Bitcoin in that case. Uh, what do I say? Oh, look, there's, yeah, uh, uh, you know, I think the financial inclusion side is, you know, the, the long-term promise. I, I think we will ultimately deliver on that. Um, but I think what is exciting is um, a, a few things in terms of the in environmental side. Um, uh, you know, great that, um, just, I guess, follow on a little bit from a, uh, Martina's response, but you know, uh, you know the fact that uh, there's no more mining in China. The fact that they outlawed it. Obviously, they did it to protect their own central bank digital currency, but it's actually good for the environment anyway that that stopped. Uh, and then, you know, migration of of, of uh, Bitcoin mining through to uh, North America, and and largely that means uh, you know fossil fuels based mining is actually too expensive, and so it's moving much more and more towards uh, you know. Uh, greener forms of power but the other thing we're seeing is a move uh, away not yet in bitcoin i don't know if that'll ever happen but say ethereum and some of these other blockchains from proof of work uh, which is that mining heavy uh, energy utilized uh, uh, consensus mechanism towards a proof of stake a voting mechanism which is about you know 99 percent a hundredfold uh, more efficient from a uh, from a uh, energy consumption perspective and uh, you know seeing that with ethereum uh, mark ii and that migration having started in december last year and hopefully delivering uh, uh, sometime next year super exciting um, uh, for the space and i think it'll do a number of things a uh, improve the environmental footprint uh, but i think also we'll see substantial reduction in gas costs thus sort of enabling those smart contracts to and 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 the blockchain to be accessible by a much broader audience. Uh, and then finally, a whole new range of smart contracts uh, that are yet to be created and, and published. So there you go, that's my two cents or 100 points worth. I might follow on from that. Um, 
I, I realize the crypto nerds have hijacked this a little bit, but um, it's true for all finance that um, in terms of cryptocurrency, there's as many coins as there are because there's that, as many visions of you know, a perfect money or how economies should function. Um, and true for lots of other innovations in finance. And while we've got to be aware that each utopia that people are envisioning might be a dystopia for someone else. So um, there's always going to be a negotiation there and sort of uh, finding utopia as a process and, and ironing out these difficulties. Um, but it seems like, every, like there's a lot of hearts in the right places because they're trying to make a better world through technology um, and make fairer economies, which um, I think is uplifting. I'll jump in really quickly, briefly, keep it brief. Um, I think for us, the definitely the green products, um, banks focusing on people as well. We know with all the repayment pauses due to COVID um, and not focusing as intensely on profit, more stakeholder capitalism rather than just shareholder um, capitalism, which is really exciting to see that also with a lot of millennials, um, the, 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 the pressure that's coming from that demographic as well and that expectation um, of how banks and, and, and the finance industry should operate as well. I think a quick concluding comment from my side is really, you know, from as especially looking in, into the sustainable area of this, right? It's no longer, and I think I agree with Sam's point on this as well, right? It's no longer just the idea that we are financing something, but it's really about how we are financing it, right? What are the implications? What's the broader impact? And we see that there are a lot of good solutions that really allow, um, you know, solutions to be developed that have got a positive impact. Um, and I think that's that sort of the exciting space. That, that we are trying to explore. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Martina, Jack, Bernie, and Sam, for being on the call with us and sharing us with us your expertise. Some of you, um, you know, I've known for a while, some of you have just met, but it's just been such a great um, conversation and uh, really appreciate your team here at Macquarie University. Incubator, Mel, Ainsley and James and Erica for all being involved and helping us continue to put on these sessions. If you're interested in um, continuing to have a relationship with us and learn more about the kinds of things that we're doing here at Macquarie, then Mel has put in the chat um, how you can join our mailing list. So definitely click on that, jump on, register, and we'll keep you in the loop. Thank you for spending the last hour of uh, the working day, or for some of us, the working day here uh, on Thursday. Really appreciate it. And um, yeah, looking forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you. Thanks all, pleasure. Thank you very much. Take care. Thanks all, see ya. <laughs>